Okay, if everybody would like to take their seats, we'll try and start. I should explain that this, this lecture and all the other plenaries are being video cast, which was in the first instance in case there was overflow in the room, or there won't be, but it does also have the advantage that anybody who knows it's being video cast can watch it anywhere in the, in the world, or at least appreciate some of what's going on in the in the Congress, but you should be aware of that. Uh, try not to <laughs> make too much noise. <laughs> okay, and you'll see in the, in the screens up here, so you'll see what the image is. Well, it gives me, as former chair of the ASA, you know, and the person who press ganged Lud is into doing this lecture at horribly short notice, for which I shall be eternally grateful to my dying day, um, to have the honor of, of presenting her. Um, this is the sixth in the annual series of ASA for lectures, which uh, actually began in, in 2008 while I was still ASA chair. Um, for those of you who aren't British, Sir Raymond Firth, who was of course New Zealand, originally was honorary president of the ASA from 1973 until his death in 2002, just before his 101st birthday. And Sir Raymond's extraordinary generous bequests to the association continue to finance a number of our key activities, in particular the grants that we award to postgraduate students to help them finish their writing up their PhDs with, together with the Royal Anthropological Institute. And Raymond continued to pro provide, play a, an active role in ASA affairs and the annual conference virtually uh, until the end. I mean, he really enlivened proceedings even well into his 90s with both kind of acute observations and astonishing wit. He was a really delightful person and a very modest person who was very much loved by the British anthropological community. So this lecture series is our tribute to his memory, but it's also known for its cutting edge contributions to anthropological scholarship. And it's my privilege today to present a speaker who is especially well qualified to give a first lecture in the first instance, and even better qualified to give a first lecture in the context of an IUS World Congress. Professor Lord Arispe is certainly one of the world's leading anthropologists. She currently holds a chair at the Regional Center for Multidisciplinary Research in the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which is one of Latin America's top higher education institutions. And she was director of the UNAM's Institute for Anthropological Research from 1991 to 1994. In the course of her career, she's also been director of Mexico's National Museum of Popular Cultures and secretary of the Mexican Academy of Sciences. So Lourdes' contribution in the domestic context of Mexico is impressive. But if you look at the rest of her career, it gets much more impressive than that. Her, her field of academic activity has really been international and in, in cosmopolitan in scope from the beginning. Uh, her higher education began with undergraduate studies in Geneva and Buenos Aires. Then she did a master's degree from Mexico's National School of Anthropology and History. And then, and here the first connection comes in, she came to England to do her doctorate at London School of Economics, which she completed in 1975. So Lourdes' anthropology has been shaped by a variety of anthropological traditions, including the most classical expression of the British social anthropology paradigm. And her intellectual work reflects an outstanding capacity to draw productively on these different influences and bring them into a creative and constructive dialogue. So that background would, in itself, make Lourdes an ideal choice for Firth lecturer. But it's equally important that she's been a leading protagonist in the modern history of IUES. 
She presided over the extremely successful 13th Congress in Mexico City, 1993, and she's currently the chair of the relatively new IUS Commission on Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, that commission project enjoys the support of the International Social Science Council, of which Lord is, was president from 2002 to 2006. Her involvement in the world of international scientific organizations is a long-standing and really important aspect of her career. From 1994 to 1998, she was Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. She's been one of the leading figures in the development of UN-sponsored global programs focusing on changing patterns of cultural diversity. And she's been a member of the Scientific Council of the World Science Organization and Gen a Secretary General of the UN Commission for Culture and Development. So it would be pretty difficult to find any anthropologist anywhere in the world who's played a more significant role in advancing the cause of anthropology at the level of the world organizations to which IUS itself is affiliated. Uh, let me end by just mentioning a few of Lourdes' own personal academic contributions over the years because they had a big influence on me personally. Those of us who began to work on Mexico in the 1970s could not fail to be inspired by the pioneering work she did on migration, ethnicity, and gender, which includes a classic monograph on indigenous women in Mexico City's informal sector, the famous Marias. And she did also did broader studies of rural, urban, and international migration and economic change, which included some very innovative work on uh, women who uh, work in agro-export sectors, including a very famous paper about part of Mexico I myself worked in. Her concern with looking at what happens to cultural practices and ethnic identities in, consider in conditions of accelerating socioeconomic change has led her in a quite logical way on to her more recent work on intangible cultural heritage. And this is work that's always kept pace with changing times, including the more depressing times created by the neoliberal devastation of Mexico's rural peasant economies and the growing influence of drug trafficking mafias over all aspects of social life in some regions of the country. But the work that Lourdes and her students are doing in these difficult contemporary conditions, and they really are difficult, uh, reminds us that whilst the contemporary anthropology of cultural change obviously can't ignore these things, it has to come to terms with them, the resilience and cultural creativity of ordinary Mexicans, who are certainly no historical strangers to suffering, continues to be quite remarkable. It needs our continuing attention. And her lecture, I think, will be broad-ranging and, and challenging and articulate a number of, of key Congress themes. So it's, it's now my sincere pleasure to invite her to begin the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. A very good friend, an excellent anthropologist, a person who knows Mexico and Latin America very well. Thank you for that. I, I really don't realize everything I've done because it's been such a pleasure doing it. I would like to start by saying, welcome to Mexico. <laughs> Oops, wrong country. <laughs> but 20 years ago, almost to this, to this day, I welcomed the anthropologists of the world to the 13th Congress of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. Some of you were there, like Mr. Paul Nkui, our great friend from Africa, and many others. I'm sorry I cannot mention all of you. I am very honored to be giving this Raymond Firth lecture. You can imagine, 20 years uh, later, I am here to speak to you. It is such a pleasure. And I am so proud also to see how 
the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences has continued its work. And so I'll be very glad to place before you my recent research, and I will have great pleasure in hearing what you think about it. From his earliest ethnographic research in Tikopia, Raymond Firth was interested in process, that is, adjustments made within the framework of social structure. One of his major contributions to anthropology, in fact, was to distinguish between social structure and social organization. He observed, for example, that people in Tikopia would behave differently towards collateral and agnatic kin relatives while using the same kinship term to speak about them. At the London School of Economics and Political Science, where I first met Professor Raymond Firth, although he was no longer lecturing at the time I was there, I learned that in ethnography, the starting point was to identify social structure while trying to reintroduce process through various other methods. This could be done, for example, through situational analysis or through Professor Max Gluck Gluckman's dictum of closed systems, open minds. Another aspect of Professor Fir's work also interested me. His participation as an original signatory of the Second Humanist Manifesto. I will comment on both these aspects of Professor Fritz's work in my paper today. Several dec decades later, in today's runaway world, social structures have rapidly become elusive as global trends chip away at traditional institutions and open paths towards warp speed transformations. In my own research, I remember I always ran into this difficulty, mainly because I always did research on processes the migration of indigenous peoples, the transformation of, of women's roles, the social perception of environmental change, the challenges of development and redistribution, the setting up of guidelines for international cultural policy, and in recent years, the rec reconfiguring of intangible cultural heritage, as we call it today. I remember how surprised I was at finding how very homogeneous groups had, in fact, a great diversity of norms, some of them in conflict, and how these could be juggled so as to apply them to diverse settings. Then I became fascinated by how the most tumultuous and conflicting debates could suddenly be compressed into precisely worded United Nations resolutions and world reports that achieved consensus. I was able to see this from the inside as I became what I have called a decision-making participant. When in the United Nations World Commission on Culture and Development and as Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. Similarly, in my recent anthropological research, I wanted to see how cultural practitioners of intangible cultural heritage manifestations reconfigure their practices and move on to new organizational organizational and ritual grounds. In this paper, I will refer to the core mechanism of such processes as social arbitration. And I would like to explore this concept as a tool that could be very useful at present for anthropology. Culture has been called a site of contestation. And for many years, I have been referring it, to it as a site of negotiation. Now in this paper, I would like to argue that culture is indeed a site of arbitration. Arbitration is defined in the Webster's Online Dictionary as the hearing and determination of a cause between parties in controversy by a person or persons chosen by the parties. Thus, while the terms of exchange, which is central to anthropology, and negotiation, so often used in policy anthropology, for example, open up rounds of reciprocity that may be endless, the concept of arbitration focuses on a specific point in debates where a decision must be taken that leads to the resolution of the dispute and steps may be taken, hopefully, to a way forward. 
although we know that sometimes steps are taken backwards. Such arbitration, it seems to me, is particularly relevant to build the new worlding, in quotes, to encompass our evolving humanity and emerging worlds in our contemporary times. I use this term worlding with reference to post-colonial studies in which authors such as Gayatri Spivak have spoken of the way in which colonialism created a history and an anthropology for the, wor for, for the world, for the peoples without history, as Eric Wolf would have called it then. However, worlding as mondialisation, in the sense proposed by Philip de Scola, becomes a broader concept which takes into account the way different societies have conceived of the relationship of human beings, animals, and plants, as well as their location in the constructed so-called natural environment. Uh, incidentally, the debate yesterday was very, very good. This, I believe, will be the new foundation on which to build a new narrative about the world. And I believe anthropologists should be present in building this narrative. In historical terms, the narrative that anthropology has used to describe the world has been primarily based on the concept of culture. However, quotes, the notion of culture as a massive system of classification which forms a grid for cognition, as Maurick Brock has recently defined it, has already been challenged by anthropologists for several decades. In fact, in my own international experience, I was very surprised to find that at the same time that we anthropologists wanted to discard the concept of culture, let alone that of civilization, the political world took up these terms and instrumentalized them into policy applications. I have written about this in previous publications, so I won't go into it now. At present, I agree with Professor Bloch, who in fact was one of the best teachers I've ever had at LSE when he suggests that the active internal debate and the continuous debate between people engaged in a social exchange of inferences are the most interesting aspects for anthropology. Having said that, as he used to say, I would add that the traditional terms of exchange and negotiation have limited use as analytical terms to understand how cultural practitioners and organizations actually move to new arenas in their thoughts and actions. I believe that something else is going on which anthropology should take up. And I believe this is the mechanism of social arbitration. So I will give two examples to discuss this. Firstly, Raymond Firth's participation in the Second Humanist Manifesto published in 1973. My own, and secondly, uh, well, my own participation as a member and supervising of the writing of the report Our Creative Diversity of the United Nations Commission on Culture and Development, uh, I, I will uh, connect to, to this. Secondly, I will present the ethnographic data as delivered by cul cultural practitioners of the Aztec dance of central Mexico today to show how the captains of the dance are taking decisions for their group as they go along in the context of rapidly changing social and political conditions in regions in which they perform these, this ritual dance. In all three examples, it seems to me that leaders and partic participants have actually been arbitrating collected dreams. They are doing so as they, they try to give social meaning and social organization to rapidly emerging processes. In a sense, in all three cases, even though they are carried out at very different levels of magnitude, the international and the local, there is the same search going on, the attempt to synchronize their ideas, performances, and actions to influence and to fit into the new worlding. Arbitrating International Visions, the Humanist Manifesto II. Raymond Firth was one of the signatories of the Second Humanist Manifesto published in 1973. 
At that time, allow me, allow me to say, I was a student at LSE and I actually, together with many of my classmates, signed the manifesto. It appeared in The Humanist in September in 1973 and was signed by scientists and writers such as Francis Crick, H.J. Eisenk, Julian Huxley, Margaret Keith. From the UK, from the UK Isaac Asimov, Betty Friedan, Irving Horowitz, B.F. Skinner, Andrei Sakharov, and Jean-François Jean Revel. It asked for a more hard-headed and realistic approach in its 17th point statement, which was, which was longer and more elaborate than the previous version of the first humanist manifesto. It was a statement reaching for a, a, a vision in a time that needs direction. Importantly for us anthropologists, the manifesto was, quotes, a social analysis in an effort at consensus, end of quotes. Similarly to the report of the World Commission on Cultural Development, it was, quotes, a design for a secular society on a planetary scale. Many of the proposals in the document, such as opposition to racism and weapons of mass destruction, support for strong human rights, are now part of the international policy discourse. And its prescriptions that divorce and birth control become legal are now a reality in a majority of countries. However, various controversial stances were also supported, notably the right to abortion, in addition to its rejection of religion. One of the oft quoted lines of this manifesto is, quote, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves end of quotes. This surely applies today to the urgency of achieving sustainability. Interestingly, in its 12th point, the manifesto looked towards, quotes, the development of a system of world law in a world order based upon transnational federal government. This would, this would appreciate cultural, this would appreciate cultural pluralism and diversity. It would not exclude pride in national origins and accomplishments, nor the handling of regional problems on a regional basis. Human progress, it stated, can no longer be achieved by focusing on one section of the world, Western or Eastern, developed or underdeveloped. For the first time in human history, no part of humankind can be isolated from any other. Each person's future is in some way linked to all. We thus affirm a commitment to the building of world community at the same time recognizing that this commits us to some hard choices. With great foresight, the manifesto emphasized that the planet Earth must be considered a single, single ecosystem. It talked about ecological damage, resource depletion, ex excessive population growth, and world poverty which must cease. Hence, quotes, Extreme disproportions in wealth, income, and economic growth should be reduced on a worldwide basis. This could again be said today. It considered technology a vital key to human progress and development, yet, yet cautioning. We would resist any moves to censor basic scientific research on moral, political, or social grounds. Technology must be carefully judged by the consequences of its use. We are particularly disturbed when technology and bureaucracy control, manipulate, or modify human beings without their consent. This was written in 1973. In closing, the signatories of the manifesto stated, we urge that parochial loyalties and inflexible moral and religious ideologies be transcended. Importantly for the topic of this paper, the signatories indicated that not all of them endorsed every detail of the Humanist Manifesto II. That is, they were arbitrating between competing ideologies and goals, not to create a new final credo or dogma, but to engage in a living and evolving process. One which, in my view, has more to do with arbitration, that is, deciding which ideas and goals are discussed are discarded and which are highlighted. It is very uh, worth mentioning briefly 
how this blueprint, blueprint for the world contrasts with the Millennium Development Goals, which have been hotly but subtly debated at the United Nations. In assessing the previous Millennium Development Goals, we at the Committee on Development Policy of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations have argued that the very practical focus on the previous goals, i.e. focusing on po poverty, potable water, maternal mortality, a goal which incidentally, among others, could have been easily achieved, yet has shown little progress or education, among others, left out broader, vital goals. These, we argued, should emphasize inclusive growth, promoting sustainable patterns of production and consumption, developing open and accountable institutions, and forging global partnerships. In this international arena, arbitration is based on geopolitical considerations that go through countless rounds of lobbying in political negotiation until a consensus is, re is reached. Using Morris Bloch's words, what is interesting in such negotiations is that one is continuously reading the minds of diplomats and politicians as they waver in their decisions according to constantly shifting agreements. Actors are constantly rereading the intention and words in discourses and then arbitrating decisions in order to get the best possible outcome. Harvesting culture around the world, the World Commission on Culture and Development. A second example of arbitration at the international level is the report, Our Creative Diversity. As explained in a previous publication, the concept of culture began to be coupled to the term of development since the 50s and became a political emblem for developing countries in the 60s and 70s. Subsequently, a decade on culture and development was established by the United Nations and the Commission on Culture and Development was created in 1992. This independent commission, chaired by former Secretary General of the United Nations, Javier Perez de Cuellar, included four Nobel laureates, and among its 40 members, only three anthropologists. Claude Lévi-Strauss, Chie Nakane, the distinguished Japanese anthropologist, and I. In 1994, I was asked to take charge of the secretariat the right that wrote the commission's report. I will very quickly uh, take you through the Commission's perspective. The first key message is that development embraces not only access to goods and services, but also the opportunity to choose a full, satisfying, valuable, and valued way of living together in society. The second key idea is that issues of development cannot be divorced from questions of ethics. The Commission saw that the intense cultural interaction caused by globalization could be a source of conflict, just as it simultaneously opened spaces for cultural exchange, borrowing, and lending. We argued that people position themselves in these spaces by turning to their most immediate, familiar, collectively shared instrument at hand to mobilize, inherited culture. At the head of its concerns, then, the Commission placed the notion of a global ethics of cultural pluralism. But we added a caveat, that only cultures that have values of respect for other cultures should be respected. In other words, intolerance in cultural domination could not be respected under the guise of respecting cultural pluralism. In other chapters, the report takes up the challenge of stimulating human creativity, looks at the world media scene, and addresses the cultural paradoxes of gender. As development transforms the relationships between men and women, and globali globalization impacts both positively and negatively on women's rights. The path forward then proposed by the Commission was to create new systems of cultural allegiances in the setting of civic communities. Within the Commission, as in the Second Humanist Manifesto, there was, of course, the dissension 
I would say a world commission is the site of a great battle and of great arbitration. In such a setting, the skill of diplomats, such as Javier Perez de Cuellar, in reading the commissioner's minds and then forcefully, forcefully taking a decision is a crucial element in the success of such a commission. There have been commissions that have failed. For example, some members of the commission wanted the report to fo focus primarily on a commitment to pluralism. But many of us opposed this view and insisted that the broader commonalities among peoples should be addressed. It was just at that time that Professor Samuel Huntington was publishing his articles and book on the clash of civilizations. To counter his view, which has, been, which has had such a disempowering effect on the West, we decided that the first chapter of the report should focus on a global ethic and the commonalities that bind humanity in the search for equity, sustainability, human rights, and so on. At this point, I would like to say a few words about the role of an anthropologist in these interna international debates. Both Chien Akane and I, as, we, as well as Henrik Ole Maga, the leader of the Sami people of Norway, spent most of our time trying to stop the commission from reifying the concept of culture. Yet, when I became assistant director general for culture at UNESCO, I could understand the difference of using this concept in scientific and political discourse. The analytical quality, the precision, the subtlety that anthro an anthropologist introduces in a political document are extremely useful. At the same time, our training in rapidly recognizing patterns of cultural and political relationships is very helpful in managing, managing debates and in lobbying for a useful outcome. At the same time, there are times when a decision-making participant must give way, as Max Weber would have said, to responsibility and efficiency. The following example will illustrate this. Every time UNESCO staff wrote a speech for me specifying that there were 6,000 languages in the world I struck this out and inserted a vague statement that there were thousands of languages, dialects, and variants. Of course, we know how difficult it is to establish these boundaries. Such vagueness, as you soon found out, was totally useless in trying to get support from government delegates for a very good project to safeguard local people's languages. They didn't see the urgency if there were all these thousands of languages. Clearly, political discourse has to be based on assertions to convince an audience. Stretching as far the precision and rigor of scientific discourse and still make an impact on a political audience then becomes the art of the possible for social scientists and for an anthropologist. Coming back to my argument in this paper, I would say that the work of the World Commission on Culture and Development is an example of the fine tuning of arbitration at the highest international level. After nine meetings in all continents, more than 200 papers written by scientists, functionaries, artists, and activists, there came a moment when a decisive carving out of the, of the core ideas had to be placed on the table. And then, it was the diverse skills of the commissioners which led to a minimal consensus which we could all live with. But the purpose of arbitration, as I see it, is to set a fixed point that then becomes a referent toward which different positions can then be explicitly stated. This is the core mechanism that I believe anthropology should look at more carefully and for which the cognitive sciences now give us more precise tools. To advance on this path, as Maurice Bloch argues, we have to change our notion of the ethnographic, the mind-reading anthropologist. The path towards seeing the ethnographic as a product of active psychological beings is a subtitle of one of the chapters of Professor Bloch's uh, recent book, 
Anthropology and the Cognitive Challenge. Morris Bloch cites Edmund Leach, who was a student of Raymond Firth, by the way, with reference to the dangers of anthropologists considering explicit statements as a foundation of cognition. The example he gave was that Australian Aborigines could have interpreted the dogma of the virgin birth as evidence that Europeans did not think that a masculine contribution is necessary for the woman to fall pregnant. What we observe from the outside, he goes on to say, quotes, is merely the outward superficial manifestation of the complex activity of the bodies and minds of naturally existing human beings, end of quotes. We now have the tools to overcome this false realism, he argues, of studying culture as an independent self-contained phenomenon derived from the harmful nature cultural dichotomy. In this sense, I would say that a cultural practice becomes a moment in time, or, uh, like, I, or I like to paraphrase Virginia Woolf, it becomes a moment of cultural being. It is always in flux. Viewed through, through this theoretical lens, the most important aspects to analyze about a cultural practice are the decisions taken by the actors that have reconfigured that practice to its present form. Such decisions are a form of arbitration, and explaining them as an anthropological task is very complicated. The individual himself, as has been frequently remarked, may not have a conscious view of her decision. We must then, as Maurice Bloch argues, read people's minds, as I have mentioned. And I would now like to apply this method to my recent research in Mexico on the Aztec dance in its present form. Reading the mind of an Aztec dancer. And I have a 10 minute video which I will show you at the end of the session to illustrate this. <clears throat> the ethnographic example I will use is, uh, to illustrate this proposition is the reconstructed or rather invented Aztec dance in, the, in, the vill in villages in the state of Morelos in Mexico. This morning we had a very good session on intangible cultural heritage and uh, presenters from India, from Japan, from uh, several countries were all talking about the reinvention of intangible cultural heritage. In carrying out a large project for the safeguarding in central Mexico, I was struck by the successive reorganization of this neo-indigenous dance called the Conchero dance, which has now ramified into different organizations and styles of the dance, one of which is called the Aztec dance. In my own research, I literally bumped into a group of Conchero dancers during my early research on the Masawa Indian migrants who went to Mexico City. As I was carrying out a household survey I suddenly saw a group of men and women dressed in purportedly Aztec attire in magnificent headdresses, walking single file along the narrow earth boundaries between the Milpa cornfield lands in Dotequiare, the village I was studying. I couldn't believe it. Such an apparition, I soon learned, was due to the fact that two Masawa migrants from the village who had gone to Mexico City had become members of this group that were doing the Conchero dance. And now they had invited the whole troop to come to their village to dance. At that time, two of my teachers, Guillermo Bonfil and Arturo Barman, had just carried out research on this newly visible dance of the Concheros. They filmed a most interesting video, which you can now see in YouTube. <laughs> After conferring with Guillermo and Arturo, who were then my teachers, I interpreted this dance as a new urban phenomenon that was drawing migrants from different ethnic groups who were feeling the loss of ritual networks they had participated in in their communities of origin. 
So imagine my surprise so many dec decades later when I began to find different variants of this conchero dance in another region, Morelos, to the south of Mexico City. Not in cities, but in rural communities. The cultural practitioners of these different dances then told me their story. The generic form of the conchero dance has continu continuously evolved since the 1950s in synchronicity with the livelihoods and ways of life of its dancers, most of whom emigrated from the villages to large cities where they met with other indigenous and non-indigenous peoples and began to invent this new kind of dance. Originally called the dance of the concheros, quotes, with a mythical beginning in the state of Querétaro, most groups of this dance were living in Mexico City, but as social and political settings they diversified, so did the motivations, the costumes, the choreographies, the music, and, and the verbal discourse of such groups. To such an extent that there are now groups just in the region of Morelos, which separately identify them as concheros de tradición, traditional concheros, concheros de conquista, uh, concheros of conquest, and Aztecs that sometimes call themselves Mexica. Mexica is the uh, name in the Nahuatl language of the Aztecs. And that's where Mexico comes from, the name Mexico comes from. They are all over central Mexico. Interestingly, many of these urban migrants then went back to their communities, but brought with them this new dance, which had by now become a tradition. <laughs> Very authentic. <laughs> Interesting. In the words of Marta Oliveros, Captain General of the Aztec Dance in the state of Morelos, the history of the dance is as follows. There was first the time of concherismo. This is a movement, concherismo, but very closely related to the Catholic question because they dance in the atriums of the churches. But then the priests sometimes do not like this dance because they want to do away with the indigenous traditions. And she continues, then came the Aztecization, the Aztecization, with the rebel chiefs, her words, of the dance, but far from settling on whether you are a conchero and I am an Aztec, it has to be understood as a historical cultural process which we have been taking in, precisely to take into our own hands all the knowledge and greatness of our culture." End of quotes. This is wonderful. The coevolution of such groups can be analyzed in terms of a constant synchronization of intention and meaning in response to contemporary social and political events. Martha explains this further. So we are at the Aztecización from the 50s to, the to 1992, more or less. A new process begins for those of us in the danza. And this is nativization. It is a planetary movement, she goes on, it is no longer from Mexican to Conchero to Nahuaca. Nahuaca means a follower of the Nahuatl tradition, which is the, the Mexica and the Aztec tradition. So it is no longer from Mexican to Conchero to Nahuaca to Aztequita. Aztequita is an endearing term for Aztec. This goes beyond this. On the 13th of March, the Mexica, Aztec, year began, but nothing ended and nothing is going to end. I think mean, they're quite fed up with this Maya end of the world. <laughs> so on the 13th of March, the Mexica year began, but nothing ended and nothing is going to end. We simply have to renovate. And what's it all about? About unconditional love, unconditional solidarity, respect for our earth, air, for all that is our culture, and feeling proud." End of quotes. Since the 90s, it is, it is also important to note that one of the most significant changes has, has been the establishment of groups of Aztec dancers 
in the United States. Like other such extensions of Mexican intangible heritage groups, for example, the mariachis, the jaraneros, and others, Aztec dance groups have been set up by migrants from villages where such dances are performed. Most of them also attract American-born descendants of Mexican and Latino migrants, as well as American-born Americans. And there's a young anthropologist here who is precisely studying this, Cristina Amezcua, in our program. Among other events, one group from San Francisco comes every year to the festival at Chalma, which is a pre-Hispanic sanctuary in central Mexico. And there, they congregate. All the groups of Concheros, Aztecs, and Mexica congregate. Now, the social structure of the Mexica dance, because there is a structure. Again, we have social structure and social organization. The internal structure follows a strict hierarchical order, which has many similarity, similarities with ancient indigenous Mesoamerican cultures. Herminio Martinez explains it, saying, quotes, in the Conchero dance, everything is set by levels. There is a chief, there is a command, there is a hierarchical organization. As to the ritual, that's it. The Concheros in the ceremony, all we do is for God, the giver of life. The giver of life is a literal translation of the Nahuatl term for God. He continues, the one, as many chiefs say, who is father and mother at the same time. God firstly, or whatever he be called. Then the honoring is for different images, as in our case, the Señor de Sacromonte, uh, one of the uh, images of, of Christ. We do the festivity, the ceremony, the sac sacrifice. This is in second place. Then for the animas, which means the spirits of the dead, for all the chiefs who died before us and through the years and centuries have left us this tradition. The terms used for the hierarchical organization vary from group to group, but the name of the officials all come from military orders. It's interesting, why? So the soldiers are allowed to play a musical instrument and to dance and obey instructions. This is how it's described. The sergeants of mesas groups organize the followers according to the captain's orders. The field surgeons, sergeants are entrusted with, with carrying the music and instruments, the flower insignias and other apt artifacts when the group marches out to dance in other venues. The alferes, an old colonial term which translates roughly into second lieutenant, carry the standard insignia of the mesa, the group. The colonels take on decision-making responsibilities when the captain is not present. Women are the saumadoras. They perform the function of, quotes, opening up the four cardinal points. Close uh, the quotes. And the cleansing of the path that they are taking and all the artifacts. They do this with a special uh, smoke of a copal, a tree resin. And they are led by the quotes, Reina Malinche. The cultural mixture is, is just amazing. The leader of the group is a captain who directs all activities of the group and is responsible for collecting the funds to feed the dancers and for travel and food along the way. Generals have several groups under their charge, but when they lose their groups, meaning that people no longer want to dance under their leadership, they become Caudillos reales. A royal caudillo is an old Spanish colonial name for a military or political leader. Or cacique general, general cacique, again an old name for indigenous nobles under Spanish colonial rule. Significantly, Ernesto said, you never lose your rank. It's interesting. You may lose your people, but they continue to recognize you. You may lose your people if you are a drunkard, a womanizer, a thief, or if you are irresponsible. Whatever you like of, or command, but everyone knows he was a general." End of quotes. This position then is structural, even if the individual transgresses the responsibilities of this structure. 
Again, we find that social organization adapts to specific behaviors but leaves the core structure intact. The programmatic structure of the all-encompassing Conchero dance is described as union, conformity, and conquest. Union, conformidad, y conquista. A phrase that is written in almost all standard insignias. However, Ernesto cautions that sometimes this phrase is as false as they exist. And he goes on. Yes, we are united because in the end of all the accounts and stories, we are here. He pointed to the ground. Conformity is because we are supposed to be in agreement with everything that we do, yet we are incapable of saying that we do not agree. Again, dissension. Finally, he added, Conquest refers to the conquest of ourselves as a people, as human beings. The first conquest is your body. The second is for the animas, because you may be tired in the night long vigils, you may want to go to bed. So you are told, no, you came here to dance, not to drink. You came to the dance because you put, up, put yourself up to it. Te pusiste a disposición. The moment you put yourself up to it, you are stuck because you have to assent to whatever the chiefs tell you to do. Um, I think I'm going to jump over one of the sections and just go back to the end. When asked why they do the Mexica dance, Ernesto answers, at times because the people asked you to do it and now it is your conscience that asks you to do it. We are here because of something. In the first place, because we like it, even though we spend a lot of money. In second place, because we want to, sometimes without too much success, at least to conserve the tradition. We know it is no, not like it was before, but we try to do it. Another question is to make it known, because otherwise, what a laugh, I die and I take all the knowledge with me and that's it. So no, one has to evolve and teach others. And now with electronic media, with Facebook and YouTube, now you open sites and you are going to find millions of opinions, all discrepant. And what I say is, let's create many points of encounter. I think this is best. <laughs> Uh, to end, this paper has dealt with the dynamics of arbitration in the case of a, a, an international com commission and that of the cultural practitioners of the Aztec dance in central Mexico. The main point I wish to highlight is that in the endless rounds of communication, discussion, negotiation, and exchange, arbitration becomes necessary to allow groups to set a reference point to go forward as groups adapt to changing social, political, and environmental conditions. Before ending, I would like to say that this paper has been a celebration of anthropolo anthropology and of its analytical power, and a tribute to teachers such as Raymond Firth, Guillermo Bonfil, Arturo Varman, who give it meaning, continuity, and purpose. I would like to end with what Marta Solares, the Captain General, of the Aztec dance said, summarizing the intentionality of all arbitration in cultural processes. She asks in carefully worded sentences, who then will write history? What are we going to write in this history? What are we going to write that is worthwhile, that may give guidance to future generations? What? I myself, was prepared by my grandparents, and they left me many things to teach. Here is the knowledge. A people who don't know where they came from cannot recognize where they are going. It is this simple. Thank you very much. I'm now going to show you the video, if I can get through the technology.
Can you say something? Yes. danza que es donde yo me muevo que vino una etapa del concherismo pero apegado muy a la cuestión católica luego vino la aztequización con jefes rebeldes de la danza les llamo yo pero todos estos cambios lejos de quedarnos en si tú eres conchero yo soy azteca hay que entenderlo como en ese proceso cultural e histórico que hemos tenido que ir tomando todos precisamente para retomar en nuestras manos todo el conocimiento y grandeza de nuestra cultura. Somos concheros, por lo que le explicaba yo, por, la, por el uso de la guitarra de concha de armadillo. ¿sí? Nosotros somos gente de conquista, ¿sí? somos gente de, eh, que usamos, tratamos de recobrar o de recuperar eh, en cierto momento el, como era en la antigüedad, ¿no? lo más que se pueda, ¿no? porque es imposible ¿no? que todo sea como en la antigüedad ¿no? y que sea el uso de la tilma, del masle, las acolceguas, todo lo demás, ¿no? todo lo que conlleva esto. La, la danza, la danza tiene así como, eh, todo, todo está por niveles, todo está, este, digamos, por, hay una cabeza, eh, hay un mando, hay una organización jer jerárquica. ¿no? Entonces, eh, en, el, en cuanto al culto, así es, por ejemplo, los, los danzantes, los concheros en la ceremonia, en cada ceremonia vamos y... Todo lo que hacemos, todo lo que ofrecemos, pues es a Dios, eh, el dador de la vida, ¿no? El, como, como dicen muchos jefes, el que es padre y madre a la vez, Dios, primeramente, como se le llama. Después, la honra es a, a las diferentes imágenes, ¿no? Por ejemplo, en nuestro caso, que venimos de Ameca Meca, y nuestro patrón es el Señor del Sacromonte. Entonces, es, es la festividad para él, la, la ceremonia, este, el sacrificio. ¿sí? Ese es el segundo lugar. En tercer lugar, para las ánimas. ¿Las ánimas de quién? Pues las ánimas de nuestros jefes, los que ya pasaron a mejor vida, que, pero que a lo largo de los años o de los siglos fueron dejando esta tradición. ¿sí? Quedamos en la aztequización de mil, desde los años 50 hasta 92 más o menos, que empieza un proceso nuevo para las gentes que estábamos en la danza, la nativización. Ya es un movimiento planetario, ya no es de conchero, a me, de mexicano, a conchero, a nahuaca, aztequita. No, señores, esto es más allá. Yo le pregunto siempre a la gente. Hoy estamos, el, el 13 de marzo empezó el Año Nuevo Mexica, pero no se acabó nada, ni se va a acabar. 
Simple y sencillamente nos tenemos que renovar. ¿Y de qué se trata ahora? Del amor incondicional, de la solidaridad incondicional, del respeto a nuestra tierra, al aire, a, a, a todo lo que es nuestra cultura. Y sentirnos orgullosos. Y hoy me puedo poner un sombrero guchol y me puedo poner un penacho del norte. Y es exactamente la misma filosofía, la misma... Hay variantes en la lengua, por ejemplo, pero con la mirada nos decimos, en un círculo de danza no necesitamos hablar, no con la boca. escribir la historia ¿qué vamos a escribir en esa historia? ¿qué vamos a poner que valga la pena y que sirva de guía a las futuras generaciones? ¿qué? a mí me prepararon mis abuelos y me dejaron muchas cosas para enseñar hay que buscar el conocimiento un pueblo que no sabe de dónde viene menos puede reconocer hacia dónde va simple Por librarnos del pecado, bendita sea su pasión. En sí es una guerra de conquista, o sea, se conquista, primero te conquistas a ti mismo, tu, tu fuerza, tu cansancio, tu, el calor, el, etcétera, te vas conquistando. Y luego conquistas a otro, le dices a la gente, aquí estamos, seguimos aquí, aunque seamos mestizitos y aunque vistamos de mezclilla todos los días y aunque tengamos celulares y todo, seguimos siendo este, mexicanos y seguimos siendo esa parte indígena que nos, va, este, que nos da sustento, ¿no? Y, y en muchos lugares así es. Eh, la gente no se da cuenta, pero en, en el corazón y en el interior sigue manteniendo esa parte. Lo que pasa que no, es muy avasallado el mundo actual, entonces entre más, entre más te, te desidentifiquen, ¿no? Para, para ellos pues es mejor. Entonces, pues una guerra, es una guerra de conquista. Te tienes que conquistar los corazones, tienes que conquistar la mente de los que te ven y de ti mismo. Pero pues al final de cuentas, para mí, para mí es... Pues es un, un, un goce particular en el sentido de que yo me siento conectada a algo más allá de mí misma. Yo en la danza he escuchado la voz de Dios, así increíblemente he escuchado la voz de Dios. Cuando las conchas están empezando a tocar y empiezan a, como a entrar en una sintonía y escuchas esa voz, para mí es la voz de Dios. Y luego en, en, durante la danza... Cuando empiezas a danzar y a tocar y a moverte y todo se vuelve una sola cosa, como que empiezas a, o sea, el ritmo te lleva como a irte desprendiendo y olvidarte de tus problemas terrenales y de tus problemas familiares todo, y trascender, a lo mejor un segundo, pero estar conectado con algo más, más allá de lo que es este, este plano que conocemos ¿no? de realidad.
say that the people who helped uh, me do this video are all young people, young anthropologists, young film filmmakers, and what they do is quite extraordinary. Uh, led by Cristina Amesca, who's the only one here. Uh, so, thank you very much. What's next? So I'll be chairing this session. Um, uh, at the end of the Q&A, the new chair of the ASA will offer a more formal vote of thanks for uh, Ludris. But for now, she has very kindly offered uh, to give us 15 minutes for a question and answer session. Uh, there are two roving mics. So um, questions, anyone? Thank you. Uh, Thomas Reuter from the University of Melbourne. I just wanted to say that um, I wanted to ask your opinion on the issue of terms such as the reinvention of tradition or the imagining of communities and this kind of terminology that a lot of indigenous people now object to. And whether you don't think it's time we come up with a, a better way to talk about this dynamic and I think uh, the lady in the film had a, a much better way to describe the historicity of how uh, traditions um, may seem to disappear and certain symbols are picked up again and reused. Just wanted to hear your views on that. Thank you. Can we take several questions? Um, can you hear me like this? Yes. Um, I haven't delved very deeply into this question of the technology that they're using. We do know that indigenous peoples use the websites to communicate, especially uh, when they have migrant groups, for example, in the United States. Uh, and what we have also seen is that young people, non-indigenous from whatever urban or community uh, young people, use their mobile phones and they film the events and then put them up on YouTube. This is happening very much. Uh, I think if young people are doing this, it is very good because they are became, becoming stakeholders of something that many of them have, would not have seen, except that now with the technology they are able to say, oh, well, there's going to be this festival, this event. So, Technology, in a sense, is helping these indigenous groups have a, lo a broader group of stakeholders, which I think is important, in order that respect for their traditions and respect for their festivities uh, should, be, should become a, a national cause, in a sense. Now, since the 80s in Mexico, we help many indigenous groups acquire the technological skills to film their own events. And let me tell you that the gaze that they have is, is very different from the gaze of an anthropologist. And they did it for some time, but then they, they lost interest in doing this. And what we are finding very much is that the media, because there is this renovated interest in indigenous traditions or in tangible cultural heritage, are very keen to go and film these events. But uh, the television channels, they arrive in these villages, they go in, they film, they, they uh, put everybody out of their way and they just film the thing and then bring it up as, as a spot on television with no background, no explanation, no nothing. It's, again, folklorized, reified and, and folklorized. So you can use technology both ways. And I, I just think that indigenous peoples must decide how they want to use this technology. 
and, and how they can use it positively for their own experience. I don't know if I answered your question, but this is what I would say. Hi, Ian Farrow, the University of Manchester. Um, I, it's kind of a similar question, really, I suppose, but um, you used the term when you were describing how the, um, uh, the dancers were learned initially in the urban areas and then were brought back to the rural areas as a tradition. And you, as an aside, you kind of said very authentic. It sounded as if you were using that term in a kind of ironic way. Um, but it seems to me that from the video that the, um, there is a discussion going on about the authenticity of these traditions, the way that, you know, it seems as if it, it was almost as if they were articulating against another view that wasn't being expressed in the film, against an accusation of inauthenticity, for instance. So I wondered if, if when you say very authentic, is that a term that they're using? Is that a reference to a term or a translation of a term that they're using? Or what is the discourse about authenticity? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, it wasn't really ironic. It, it was just pointing to the complexity of the term of authenticity, because I was deeply involved in UNESCO in creating this 2003 Convention for Intangible Cultural Heritage. And we had these endless discussions, first of all, on the concept of intangible cultural heritage, which is so awkward, but it was the only thing we could come up with. Um, we tried, we really tried. We, we, tried with many other terms, some very funny ones too. And then when the, well, lots of things happened with the convention, but when it finally came into force, the whole question was this of authenticity. There's a long history of discussion of that in UNESCO with reference to the World Heritage List, where when I arrived in UNESCO, we had to hold a meeting in Nara in Japan to change the criterion <laughs> of the list because there was a criterion that said that only heritage which was more than 200 or 300 years old could be put on the list. And of course, the Nara temples are these beautiful temples that are reconstructed because they're made on wood, uh, exactly according to the original design, but it's new wood. So at the Nara conference, we changed this criterion of authenticity, it didn't have to be old, and in fact, uh, there was a, a commission that looked at the World Heritage List and recommended several very important things. First, that not only old heritage should be on the list, there could be new heritage, like the city of Brasilia, which was very important. That there was not enough heritage related to women, it was always men's heritage. That most of the heritage was urban and not enough uh, heritage was, was rural, and in fact, a new uh, section uh, was created of the World Heritage, Heritage, Heritage List, uh, which is now called cultural landscapes, like the coffee plantations in Cuba or the rice plantations in Manila, and so on. Uh, many of these criteria were changed. So when we started discussing the Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage, the idea was not to have such strict criterion, and in fact, this is why the list of that convention is called the representative list, rather than the set or established list of the World Heritage Sites. This, however, has run into lots of problems, because what is representative? I, was, I, I never agreed to this term of representative. What representative of who, what? Um, but at least the concept of authenticity then is no longer uh, a problem with the 2003 convention. And uh, since it's a living heritage, then it, nobody asks whether it's authentic if they use jeans or mobile phones like uh, one of the dancers was saying. Nobody's worried about that. So when I mentioned authenticity, is in the sense of you can create an authentic tradition out of nothing. Well, not out of nothing, but uh, you, you should have the liberty of doing this. Thank you very much, Lourdes. I just wanted to go back on this 
term that you have presented to us of cultural arbitration. And I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit more by comparing your two ethnographic examples, the one at the very high level of UN negotiations and the one at the local level of central Mexico. Um, can you say something a, a little bit more about how consensus is created about the politics of filtering? What is actually, you know, at what level you decide that you have enough elements to create that social structure. You know, you could think of people who are too fundamentalist, want to include too much, as you said yourself, or people who are looking for the very lowest um, denominator, common denominator, and that has very different kind of political implications. And from there, you know, you had this beautiful term, I can't remember now, when you said, I was a poli political, no, I was a decision-making participant. But then, of course, decision-making is about implementing. So could you say something as well about how you go from, you know, that level of arbitration to the implementation of what has been arbitrated and what could be said there? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an extremely good question, but extremely complicated question. <laughs> um, what I did find very interesting was that in the end, in no process of negotiation, you get to really know everything that went on. Perhaps the highest level officials uh, could. But I found that there were some seven floors. This is how I describe it. Seven floors of motivations in any discussion. What gets into the papers is usually the first and maybe the second floor. What you get in comments uh, in the lobby and among some delegates is the third and fourth floor. The fifth floor you only get at very special uh, group meetings, which can be a dinner with ambassadors or a very special friendly delegate who will tell you certain things that nobody else knows. By the time you get to the sixth floor, you are dealing with the very, very subtle knowledge uh, of officials. And the seventh floor is mostly tacit knowledge, knowledge which is never expressed verbally. It is implied. So when you're dealing with these seven floors, um, you really have to be on your toes. <laughs> And so the most skilled diplomats or the most skilled politicians are those who can read people's minds fully along these perhaps seven, seven floors is extraordinary. That's uh, presidents of countries or <laughs> ministers of very powerful countries. But um, they have to be constantly finding out what the motivations are. But it gets more complicated because motivations change according to alliances. So you have to know what the core purpose is uh, when you are discussing a certain uh, resolution or a certain program, say at the United Nations. And it's only if you know the, the core aim of the most powerful actors in that group you can understand the sort of negotiations and lobbying that goes on, and finally the, uh, the arbitration. You, you can identify the moment of arbitration, which is at four in the morning after everybody has given speeches and has gone out to the lobby and have negotiated something. Suddenly you see the powerful delegates coming in, sitting down, and then you say, ah, it's been arbitrated. And then there are very precise interventions saying, ta, 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 the decision is this. Now, for an anthropologist, it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> except, except that we can't talk about it. <laughs> when you become a high official in the United Nations and in corporations, I think, in governments, whatever, you have to sign a statement saying that you will never disclose uh, the 
inside information of the corporation or organization. So, of course, and this has to be so because there's such different kinds of decisions that are taken. That's the other thing that I found very interesting. Because if you're doing policy uh, anthropology, you mostly see the overt discussion, the overt positions, the overt declarations. But when you are on the inside, you suddenly realize that there are decisions that are taken but never implemented, never meant to be implemented. There are alliances that are instantaneous but have no continuity in time. That there are, for example, criticism of the United Nations organization, which is totally unjustified, totally unfair, but which the delegates have to do because the organization is the buffer in the conflict between states. And you have to absorb that. And you, if you understand what is going on as an international civil servant, you just gulp and say, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> it, was, it was the fault of UNESCO or the fault of this committee or the fault of it. And in this way, you, you help delegations find consensus eventually. So there are all these nuances that one day I would like to sit down and really write about. <laughs> that are interesting. Do you have time for one more question? I was wondering if you thought we could uh, rehabilitate the idea of authenticity by picking up on uh, by abandoning the idea of oldness as authentic, which is implied. Sorry, could you speak up a bit? Sorry, I can't hear you. is it on? Okay. The authenticity, even that's criticized with the words marginal, imagined community or invented tradition, assumes that real traditions are not imagined and invented. And I wondered if we could rehabilitate the idea of authenticity or what you thought of the idea by picking up on other aspects of what your informants were saying, which is our own tradition, that is, an authentic tradition is owned by the people who are enacting it, rather than, uh, and they're in charge of deciding what its content is, as opposed to photographic records or media presentations or something which um, perhaps uh, freeze it and take that process out of it. This was absolutely fascinating, and there's one other aspect that I think you've kind of identified, if not articulated, uh, and that is what some people have called the working misunderstanding or the shared misunderstanding, where we all agree on the same language, even if we walk away with our own separate ideas of what it means. And diplomats are the master of this, of finding some words that everybody can agree upon, everybody's happy with, but then they walk away thinking, ah, I got what I wanted. <laughs> True. Yes, on, on ownership, it's a very good question. Um, the thing about ownership is that how, how deep is this ownership? Um, you, you have to give time for people to really understand and take in uh, the ownership of, of a tradition. It is very easy to understand it when children are induced into uh, certain cultural practices when they are very young, because then it, it really becomes sort of structural to their personality. And that, that's a real ownership. But when things are changing so rapidly as they are in our runaway world, then traditions are changing very rapidly. So where is the ownership? And how can, yes? Sorry, wait, wait, wait. Can you? This is 
quoting one of my Asante informants from Ghana who said, the migrants, they only know our old traditions, but you know our very latest traditions. <laughs> That's a very good quote. That's a very good quote. And I think we should do some studies about the, the when traditions that migrants take create niches. And, and it's a niche that, is, that is, stays paralyzed in time. So that sometimes you get the people from the old tradition which has changed coming and finding that, they, well, this is no longer the tradition that, that they have here. It, it has happened to me in, in migration studies. But uh, this is where uh, it's a question of, of people having the right to decide that, well, we want to keep this. And even if we're disconnected from the original source of that tradition, this is still ours. And it's still ours. Yes, in virtue of this uh, source, but really it's ours because here today, now, it gives us meaning. And this is, I think, what we have to understand. And um, about shared understandings and misunderstandings, <laughs> I, I agree very much. It's all in this uh, reciprocal exchanging of meanings and of some groups trying to go ahead and other groups wanting to stay back. Uh, and so it's a very dynamic thing, but this is what is so fascinating about all these processes. I think we should stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it is a real pleasure to be able to, to be here to give a vote of thanks for this very inspiring lecture, and I'm sure that I won't be able to do justice to it because I'm going to be brief, but Lord, it has taken us through a sort of vast range of levels at which anthropology can apply our disciplinary strength. We began by thinking about the involvement of anthropology at a transnational level, and in, in, at a fora in which there are efforts that are made to consider common human goals and, and needs and the challenge of compressing these intensely uh, complex uh, issues into universally comprehensible resolutions. And that's a challenge and a half. And the role as anthropology as decision-making participants, which I think is exciting in, in, in the notion of us being integral to the formation of a narrative. Um, the efforts to write a humanist manifesto which would actually be inclusive of cultural diversity seems to be a very core goal here. Um, and, and this notion of transnational governance, of course, has emerged at the same time as sort of very hegemonic developmental processes of globalization, which is, you know, and even the notion of harvesting culture uh, it, it makes one slightly nervous. And so the role of anthropologists in uh, applying our critical analysis to the other end of the scale and providing deep understandings of cultural diversity seems to me absolutely critical. And then in this wonderful description of Aztec dance, we get a keen sense of small cultural groups trying to promote in, the, in a continually changing political arena their own ideas and values and hopes for the future and hopes to, re to present their own history in a particular way. Um, and then we get this vision of ethnography as, as, as a sort of uh, diplomatic arbitration between that local fora and, and the sort of transnational debates, along with a very reflexive eye on that process itself. So we get this lovely vision of anthropology as a, a translation between cultures at a local level, but also as a, as a mediatory force between them and transnational discourses. And I was very struck by the parallel of, of how we compose our own discipline in which we compare cultural difference in order to understand, in which we all uh, work very much at a local level, but also speak to each other metadiscursively, as we are doing at this conference about common human, uh, what you call commonality, and the things that bind humanity. 
So this gives us a very inspiring vision of anthropology as having on the one hand intellectual processes that mediate between the local and global, and then this exciting vision of anthropology as having a political role to play in, that matches that intellectual role in, in arbitrating between local and global discourses. Uh, this is indeed a celebratory vision, and so I'd like to offer thanks, I think, on behalf of all of us for a thoroughly inspiring and engaging lecture. Many thanks.